Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning uh, from where I'm calling from. It's currently 8 a.m. in Boston. I believe it's 2 p.m. where you guys are. Uh, but it is an honor and privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, as Demetria has mentioned, uh, the, the working title of my paper is The Evangelical Crisis and the Future of Christian Social Engagement. Throughout the history of the Christian church, a fundamental question that has occupied the minds of its members has been, how should the church balance its witness in the public square alongside its commitment to social engagement? The central purpose of this paper is to explore the relationship between Christian social engagement in the public square and Christian theology and social ethics. The methodology for this investigation will be achieved through the integration of the complementary ethics and visions of evangelical leaders who have advocated for concrete impl implementations of social change. This investigation seeks to propose a socio-political system for fostering human flourishing for all members of society. Throughout Christian history, the church has endured a series of schisms. Within each passing watershed moment, questions loomed of what these splits would mean for the future of the faith. From the rise of Christendom leading to the departure of the most devout Christians into the desert, to the spark of the Protestant Reformation resulting in the Catholic Protestant divide, the Christian identity has ebbed and flowed throughout eras of revival and crisis. In a similar way, the glory days of the early evangelical movement have passed, and the modern day American evangelical church is now in a moment of crisis. Should the American evangelical church seek to return to its heritage of revivalism, it must first acknowledge the crisis before it. What then is the evangelical crisis? One of the first characteristics of the evangelical crisis can be identified in the exodus of the younger generation from the evangelical church. A recent Gallup survey revealed that Americans' memberships in houses of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's eight-decade trend. While one might rightly associate part of the reasoning for this decline to the global pandemic, this trend not only precedes the pandemic, but also reveals a sharp difference in church attendance among differing generations. According to the survey, church membership strongly is strongly correlated with age, as 66% of traditionalists belong to a church, compared to 58% of baby boomers, 50% of those Generation X, and 36% of millennials. The limited data Gallup has on church membership among the portion of Generation Z that has reached adulthood are so far showing church membership rates similar to those for millennials. So the 30% disparity between traditionalists and millennials and Generation Z reveals the gravity of this decline. While part of the reason for this change is population shift, the survey also reveals that the two major trends driving the drop in church membership are more adults with no religious preference and falling rates of church membership among those who do have a religion are apparent in each of these generations over time. The data is clear that the exodus of younger generations from the church is an ever-present reality for the evangelical community. Why then are younger evangelicals leaving the church? This question leads to the second characteristic of the evangelical crisis as the polarization of politics and social issues in the church. For many years, the narrative that circulated in evangelical circles was that modernity and secularism were the primary reasons for people leaving the church. However, many evangelical leaders today are claiming that this exodus from the church may have less to do with secularism and more with the church itself. Public theologian at Christianity Today, Dr. Russell Moore, recently stated, what seems different about this quiet exodus is that the, that, is that the departures are heightened not among the peripheries of the church, those nominal or cultural Christians who grow up and rebel against their parents' beliefs, but instead among those who are the most committed to what were previously thought to be the hardest aspects of Christian religion and modernity, being belief in the supernatural, the rigorous demands of discipleship, and a longing for community and accountability in multi in a multi-generational church with ancient roots and, and transcendent authority. We now see young evangelicals walking away from evangelicalism not because they do not believe what the church teaches, but because they believe the church itself does not believe what the church teaches. The, per, 
the, the presenting issue is in this secularization is not scientism and hedonism, but disillusionment and cynicism. He goes on to explain that the reason for this cynicism and disillusionment has to do with, polar, with the polarization of social issues as political issues, as many have pointed to compelling data showing that the politicization of American religion is a key driver of people away from religious affiliation. In 2010, Harvard professor of public policy, Dr. Robert Putnam, and professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame, Dr. David Campbell, traced the history of this polarization, stating that during the 1980s, the public face of Amer American religion turned sharply right. Political allegiances and religious observance became more closely aligned, and both religion and politics became more polarized. Abortion and homosexuality became more prominent issues on the national political agenda, and activists such as Jerry Falwell and Ralph Reed began looking to expand religious activism into electoral politics. Church attendance gradually became a primary dividing line between Republicans and Democrats in national elections. As a result of this, many millennials who identified themselves as either moderate or progressive found themselves feeling increasingly marginalized from the evangelical community. And while abortion and homosexuality took the center stage for the conservative evangelical movement, all other social issues such as racial injustice, immigration, and climate change were also politicized and dismissed as liberal. This dichotomy has left many millennials feeling unsatisfied with evangelicalism. And as Generation Z ages into the conversation, they're finding American evangelicalism to look more like an oppressive political institution than the church. The politicization of social issues remains a central obstacle to the evangelical crisis. The third characteristic of the evangelical crisis is an extension of the polarization of politics and social issues a toxic loyalty to partisan politics. This is most clearly portrayed in the aftermath of a highly divisive and contentious political cycle. Executive Director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, Dr. Ed Stetzer, recently articulated how the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol revealed just how deep and depraved the state of the politics in our nation is and its impact on the witness of the evangelical church. He writes, Tempered, tempted by power and trapped within a culture war theology. Too many evangelicals tied their faith to a man who embodied neither their faith nor their vision of political character. As a result, we are finally witnessing an evangelical reckoning. This, rec this reckoning signifies a watershed moment as the future of the evangelical movement hangs in the balance and whether it responds by reconsidering its witness in the public square or continues in business as usual in its vision of social engagement. <clears throat> the exodus of the younger generation, the polarization of social issues, and a toxic loyalty to partisan politics are all characteristics of the evangelical crisis. The consequences of the crisis are already being felt as the introduction of the Equality Act offers protection for LGBTQ individuals, and yet for many evangelical poses as a threat to their religious liberty. President of the National Association of Evangelicals, Dr. Walter Kim, recently commented that this one-sided bill would guarantee decades of continued polarization rather than providing the basis for Americans to live together peace peacefully despite prof our profound differences. Therefore, the future of the American Evangelical Church must seek a solution to account for the internal integrity of its witness along with its external posture in the public square. And considering the external pressures of the Eva American Evangelical Church is experiencing, it is important to consider the context in which it is located. The reality is that the Evangelical Church's commitment to social engagement is often at odds with the context it finds itself in. This context is secular, democratic, and pluralistic in nature, meaning that the, that the monarchical and theocratic models of government do not apply within American society. The ethos of pluralism allows the First Amendment protection of religious liberty to be extended to a vast marketplace of religious ideals. Furthermore, this ethos of pluralism lends itself to the expression of diversity in cultural practices, convictions, and norms. 
Therefore, as the American evangelicalism, as American evangelicalism navigates its, its context in a pluralistic society, it must consider how it should balance its witness in the public square alongside its commitment to social engagement. By seeking to resolve this tension, the evangelical church may also stumble upon a solution to address the present crisis. Since the dawn of the evangelical movement in the 18th century, the church, the church had to learn how to navigate its commitment to social engagement in democratic society. Evangelicals were low in the social status at the genesis of the movement, yet the leaders of the movement preached that each individual, no matter how low in the social structure, was given to understand that he or she was important to God. Each was given opportunity for emotional expression. Each was encouraged, even required, to acquire great personal self-discipline. Each was provided opportunity to engage in works of charity and compassion. British historian, Dr. David Bebbington has noted that historically there are four primary characteristics that define evangelicalism, conversionism, activism, biblicism, and crucicentrism. Focusing on the second characteristic of activism, I will explore how key leaders of the movement theologically understood and ethically applied their commitment to social engagement. <clears throat> Arguably one of the most important leaders of the early evangelical movement, Dr. John Wesley, or John Wesley was a preacher, theologian, and revivalist in the Methodist church. While while he is most commonly known for his theological writings, such as on sanctification, Wesley also wrote on social issues such as money, economics, slavery, and politics. In one of Wesley's last writings to William Wilberforce, Wesley encouraged Wilberforce to continue in the fight to outlaw slavery in Britain and to go in the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. Wesley spoke plainly against the evils of slavery and his theological commitment to social engagement led him to stand with marginalized and oppressed communities. It is also important to note that when it came to Wesley's posture towards the public square, he was much more loyal to monarchy than to American democracy. In his, in his calm address to our American colonies, he wrote in regards to democracy saying, no government under heaven is so despotic as the Republican. No subjects are governed in so arbitrary a manner as those of a commonwealth. Wesley believed that democracy and human rights were incompatible to one another and spoke openly against the false freedom of American democracy. Therefore, by examining Wesley's social engagement in the public square, it is clear that he spoke with boldness and zeal promoting his theological convictions and against the social evils of his day. A second important leader of the evangelical movement to consider is Charles Finney, a Presbyterian revivalist preacher who proclaimed that true salvation has social implications and that the evangelical gospel cannot be sustained if it ignores the social realities obstructing its practical expression in the lives of the newly converted. Finney abridged, Finney bridged his theological convictions with his social ethics. He argued that indifference towards or opposition to either of these being the anti-slavery and temperance movements was in direct conflict with evangelical faith. Regarding the notion of revival, Finney challenged evangelicals to reconsider their authenticity arguing. Formerly, it used to be established, it used to be the established belief that a revival could not be stopped because it was the work of God. And so they supposed it would go on, whatever might be done to hinder it, in the church or out of it. But the farmer might just as well reason so and think that he could go and cut down his wheat and not hurt the crop because it is God that makes the, cop, the crop grow. A revival is the work of God and so is a crop of wheat. And God is as much dependent on the use of means in one case as the other. And therefore a revival is as liable to be injured as a wheat field. Revivals are hindered when ministers and churches take wrong ground in regards to any question involving human rights. It is here where a parallel can be drawn between Finney's ethic of revival and the evangelical crisis. According to this ethic, when the evangelical church fails to acknowledge the human rights of others, 
such as the migration crisis at the border or, or police violence against black lives. It actually hinders the church's ability to experience revival. Finney, Finney's call serves as a prophetic declaration for how to respond to the evangelical crisis and for the witness of the church in the public square. The third evangelical leader who addressed the church's role in the public square was a Danish philosopher theologian by the name of Soren Kierkegaard. His most notable contribution to this conversation was in his critique of Christendom. In his writing, Attack Upon Christendom, was, it was a ruthless exposure of the hypocrisies of church leadership and religious culture. Kierkegaard believed that the church of his time was living unfaithfully to, to, to true Christianity that was present in the New Testament. For Kierkegaard, the church's commitment to social engagement was not a self-interested pursuit, but one of self-sacrificial love. Therefore, the witness of the church should remain uncompromised by the political systems of this world, for it finds its value in the eternal and not the temporal. The fourth and final leader of the evangelical movement to consider is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Baptist minister and leader of the civil rights movement, King was similar to Finney in that his orthodoxy aligned with his orthopraxy. He took the evangelical commitment to social engagement to heart and critiqued the church for its inaction, stating, in deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church and how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and fear of being nonconformists. King is an important figure in to this study because he represented a theological voice that was unpopular in religious as well as secular spheres. His witness in the public square was prophetic and despised, and it was not until his passing that his message was truly appreciated. King represented the reality that sometimes Christians must enter into the culture war. And although its witness may be seemingly compromised in the moment, only time can reveal the arc of truth and justice. Wesley Finney, Kierkegaard, and King were all formative leaders of the evangelical movement in their own unique ways and provide a variety of solutions for how to respond to the evangelical crisis at hand. The theology and ethics of each of these figures played a formative role in the expression of their commitment to be socially engaged in the public square. What remains as a unified factor among each of these theologians was their commitment to just relationships, regardless of external circumstances. While both Wesley and Finney advocated for the abolition of slavery, King stood on their shoulders and continued to fight in the struggle against racism and the flourishment of all humankind. Kierkegaard, in his own right, affirmed that just relationships cannot be achieved through the paradigm of Christendom, but by a pursuit of, new of a New Testament ethic of self-sacrificial love and service without reward in a pluralistic culture. The question then becomes, do these models of social engagement align with the operating norms of the Christian faith? In other words, are these actions right and good? In terms of how Kierkegaard admonishes the church to resist the temptation of Christendom, he is correct in stating that, it, that this, is, that this mostly clo most closely aligns with a biblical ethic for social engagement. Furthermore, the posture from the margins which Wesley, Finney, and King take to pursue justice in the public square are also consistent with a biblical social ethic as the early disciples spoke from their theological convictions with no competitive, competitive advantage over other religious groups in their time. As far as the goodness of their actions to love God and neighbor is considered to be the supreme ethic of the Christian faith. Therefore, the models of social engagement proposed by these evangelical leaders are consistent with the operating norms of the Christian faith. In envisioning the future of Christian social engagement, the American evangelical church must confront the evangelical crisis and embrace an ethical solution that seeks the flourishment of all humanity and not just its own self-interests. The church must identify itself within a larger community and understand that its commitment to social engagement is located within a pluralistic society. The church must understand itself as an equal participant in the marketplace of religious ideals and is equally susceptible to the ebbs and flows of the cultural climate. In light of this reality, 
I will propose the following ethical solutions to begin to address the evangelical crisis and envision a future for Christian social engagement. First, the American Evangelical Church should rightly maintain its commitment to social engagement in the public square. Following in the footsteps of its founders, there is a commitment to prophetic action that is a central expression of the evangelical faith. Wesley, Finney, and King all advocated for oppressed communities, whether they were Christian or not. They used their freedom of speech and religion to their advantage to seek liberation from slavery, racism, and injustice. These faith leaders understood the theological underpinnings of a Christian social ethic and were unafraid to transcend the cultural norms and beliefs in the name of justice and equality. At the same time, the American Evangelical Church today must also grow in its own self-awareness and interpersonal relationships in the public square. It must become self-aware by engaging in a continual practice of self-reflection, examining its weaknesses and probing for blind spots. It must ask how it, per how it perceives itself, how it is perceived by others and take into consideration the criticisms it receives. This leads to the importance of growing in its interpersonal relationships in the public square. The evangelical church must also not only be aware of how it is perceived by others, but also understand the socio-cultural context in which it exists. As I mentioned before, the church must understand itself as an equal participant in the marketplace of religious ideals. The post-Christendom moment in which Kierkegaard envisioned has now come to pass as our, current, as our current American society has matured and is continually maturing into a more pluralistic society. This pluralism is cultural, philosophical, religious, and ideological. Therefore, in the same way, the freedom of speech and religion gives evangelical Christians the right to exercise their faith in a pluralistic society, so also the church must respect the freedoms of others whether they agree with them or not. This is why interpersonal or interorganizational relationships must be fundamentally respected in the public square of a pluralistic society. What happens then if the church does not respect others in the public arena or conduct itself in a manner that dishonors its witness, such as with the problems that have arisen within the evangelical crisis? It is here where I propose that the church must embrace a public theology of repentance that redeems the credibility of the Christian witness in the public square. Based on the New Testament passage, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. A public theology of repentance signifies to change one's mind and to turn away from hypocrisy and sin. It is a commitment to a new way of living in the world should the American Evangelical Church embrace this public theology and repents for its shortcomings, it can then begin to live consistently with the very message it proclaims to repent and believe. The American Evangelical Church need not be replaced, but transformed. An ethic of transformation is not only central to their commitment to social engagement, but also to the very message of salvation it proclaims. Therefore, there is no response that is more fitting at this historical juncture for the evangelical church than to practice what it preaches. By undertaking this process of repentance and transformation, the church can begin to address the accusations of hypocrisy and di di divisiveness in a proactive way. Younger generations can see a community that practices authenticity and may feel more inclined to return. The church can no longer be a pawn on a political chessboard, but must regain its prophetic voice that speaks on its own authority. Repentance is the most suitable solution to acknowledge and to begin to resolve the evangelical crisis. However, a public theology of repentance is not only beneficial for the evangelical community, but also for the public square as well. The reality is that much of the evil and political polarization that has manifested itself through the evangelical crisis is merely a reflection of the larger schisms of our society. Both political parties and US democracy have contributed their fair share of injustice and oppression to minoritized communities. Therefore, a public theology of repentance can serve as a model 
for organizations, systems, and institutions to turn away from their own hypocrisy and shortcomings and to work toward and to work together to find better solutions to the problems society faces in a more healthy and unified way. It is only when the American Evangelical Church embraces a public theology of repentance that it can begin to address the evangelical crisis. It can begin to address its shortcomings and polarization of social issues informed by their politics rather than their faith. It can also provide an opportunity for the church to move from a place of toxic political alliances to healthy practices of mutual collaboration. The church's participation in a public theology of repentance can also provide them with an opportunity to be an example for other ins institutions for how to address their own historical shortcomings and contributions to social evil and to begin a process of systemic change and social transformation. A public theology of repentance can serve as a model for how to participate in social engagement in our modern society for the flourishment of all humankind, rather than for the self-interest of particular communities. By doing so, the American Evangelical Church has the opportunity to redeem the credibility of its witness in the public square and to continue in its commitment to social engagement and face challenges beyond its present crisis. To summarize, this paper has diagnosed and assessed the evangelical crisis as the major obstacle to the future of Christian social engagement. According to the empirical data presented, the evidence supports that the exodus of the younger generation from the evangelical church is correlated with the polarization of social issues, marginalizing those who identify as more mod moderate or progressive, and a toxic loyalty to partisan politics in some parts of the evangelical community. In analyzing the theological landscape of Christian social engagement from the beginning of the evangelical movement, it is clear that key leaders such as Wesley, Finney, and King all exemplified the evangelical commitment to advocacy for marginalized and oppressed communities, regardless of their religious beliefs or political affiliation. Furthermore, Kierkegaard believed the church to abandon a Christendom culture of self-interest and return to a genuine expression of the Christian faith of self-sacrificial love as modeled in New Testament Christianity. It is based on these insights and solutions from these evangelical leaders that the American Evangelical Church can begin to resolve the evangelical crisis by balancing its commitment to social engagement and its witness in the public square. These solutions include, but are not limited to, maintaining its commitment to social engagement in the public square, growing in its own self-awareness and interpersonal relationships in a pluralistic society, and embracing a public theology of repentance that redeems the credibility of its Christian witness in the public square. It is only when these steps are taken that the future of Christian social engagement in the evangelical community will be able to thrive. The evangelical church can no longer afford to continue as a polarized community. Rather, the church must embrace an ethic of wisdom and humility to pursue the flourishment of all humankind. As stated by the president of Christianity today, Timothy Dalrymple, rather than withdrawing into communities of common loathing, the church should be offering a community of common love, a sanctuary from the fragmentation and polarization, from the loneliness and isolation of the present moment. The church should model what it means to care for one another in spite of our differences on social and political matters and affirm the incomparably deeper rootedness of our identity in Christ. As the American Evangelical Church envisions the future of Christian social engagement, there are many questions that remain unanswered. There is still much uncertainty of how the COVID-19 pandemic will affect church attendance as the world slowly begins to open up. As younger evangelicals increasingly are increasingly deconstructing their Christian faith, the church must also begin to think about how not only to provide adequate answers to their questions, but a sincere spirituality for them to embrace. Finally, the tension of race, uh, the, the tension of race remains a persistent obstacle within American evangelicalism, as new denunciations of critical race theory continue to splinter the church along racial lines. As long as these social issues remain unresolved within the evangelical community, the church's public witness will continue to remain at risk. The evangelical church must therefore redirect its commitment to social engagement to be not only outward, but inward as well. For to do so will only strengthen its Christian witness in the public square. 
This is the work that must be done for the flourishment of the future of evangelicalism within American democracy. Thank you.